So thank you all for turning in your uh, assignment 101s. Today you got a handout for assignment 102, which is your next one. So like I said, in this class, I try to keep the workload fairly consistent. So you turn in an assignment, you're going to get the next assignment. And it'll, it'll, it'll work that way for a while at least. Uh, this, this particular assignment is due on Monday the 1st of October. So we've got a little bit of time for that, a little bit longer than this last one. Um, you'll be combining two or more photographs together. I would encourage you to stick more in the realm of just two. Um, good example of that is, is down at the bottom of the handout so that you guys can see that. Um, I will go over on, let me just make sure I get this, next Wednesday the 19th, or sorry, in like two days, the 19th. My weeks are still screwed up. Uh, so next class I'll go over a bunch of examples, uh, both professional examples and student examples from previous semesters um, so you guys can get some ideas flowing and, and get ready to, to start working on it. Couple key notes about this. Um, first off, you have to use your own photographs for this. You can't do a Google image search and use somebody else's photos and combine those together. You actually have to take all the pictures that are involved in this. So that's an absolute requirement uh, of the assignments. Um, trying to think what else. Uh, you don't really have the skills to do it quite yet, so that's okay. We're going to build those skills before it's due, uh, but at least I wanted to get this handed out so you can start thinking about what are the kinds of things that you might want to um, combine together. So that's there. It should be on the back burner in your mind. Today we're going to talk about high dynamic range and panoramic photography, uh, both of which are interesting topics, um, but really when we get to the, the actual lab portion of the class, a lot of today is about masking in Photoshop and, and how masks work. I'm going to use these two topics to, to show you how masking works in Photoshop. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do it later. Don't worry about it. Um, so we'll talk a lot about masking today and the, the mechanics of masking because it's something that's, that's absolutely critical that you know how to do in Photoshop. Uh, but for right now, I want to introduce two different topics. One is high dynamic range photography and the other is panoramic photography. I talked a little bit about high dynamic range photography uh, in, the, in the kind of intro to photography in general, but we'll spend a little bit more time actually discussing it today because it's the kind of image that you see more and more frequently online. Certainly as a designer, as an architect, you want to showcase a particular site or, or building. This is a technique that can really enhance your photos um, to begin with. So essentially what high dynamic range image is, is it's a way of allowing us to see a stagnant photograph the way that our eyes see a scene. And so this is the technical definition, but I want to try to explain it to you uh, in, the, in the best way that I can. So when we look, let's say we're all on the beach. Wouldn't that be nice, right? We're all on the beach and we're looking at a sunset. And as we look around at a sunset, we look up at the sky and we see the pinks and purples and it's beautiful. And then we look down at our feet and we can still see the sand. We look out at the ocean, we can see the ocean. Our brains are constantly changing what our eyes are seeing. They're processing what our eyes are seeing. And our eyes are, are really quickly adjusting, right? Our irises are changing. We can see different light levels just by as we glance around. Same thing happens in this room. If you look down at your feet, it's dark. You can see the, the detail on the carpet. Then you look up and you look out and you can see the detail that's outside because our brains compensate and process that. In a photograph, the exposure is set. It's fixed. You expose for something. Let's say it's the, the we're, we're back on the beach, we're taking a picture, we expose for the sky. Well, if we expose correctly for the sky, all the sand and everything that's dark will be really dark and black. And when we go to look at the photograph afterward, it's not going to change for us. The way that being at the scene, our eyes change. Does that make sense? So it's a fixed thing. Once it goes into a photograph, it's a fixed thing. And we can't change it. Our eyes can't reprocess it and can't see different details. So what we do is we try to use this technique to mimic the way that our eyes actually see something. So that when we take a picture of that sunset, it looks the way it did when we were actually there looking at it. So it looks like this, where we can see this detail. We can see what's happening in the shadows. And if you've ever gone and tried to take a picture of a photograph, you've, you've experienced this, or of a sunset, you've experienced this. It doesn't always turn out the, what it looked like. So what do we do? How does this work? Essentially, we're taking three, five, or seven exposures at once, 
and we're fusing all those exposures together into one image. So it takes more than one image to do it. And we're going we're gonna to work with multiple images today. I have sample images. I asked you to try to take some of your own. If it doesn't work, um, that's OK. I have samples that you'll play around with today. But we're taking these three images, and we're fusing them together into one image. Why? So we have a couple different reasons. First off, from an artistic standpoint, we'd like to see the photograph the way we saw the scene. You go and you take a picture of a beautiful sunset. The idea is that down the road, you'd like to go back and look at that photograph and see what the sunset looked like and remember what it looked like and have it actually look like the sunset that you saw. So that's a, certainly a, a valid reason for why you would want to do it. We're also trying to mimic how the eye sees something. So we're trying to see everything in a scene, not just one piece of it. The other half of this, and for those of you that are in 136 or will plan on taking 136 down the road, this is a big deal. I say rendering here. Essentially, we will use these high dynamic range images in their untone mapped, unprocessed state. They won't look good as images as part of the rendering engine for backgrounds when we do rendering. And the reason that we use a high dynamic range image is it, became, it contains all of the different light levels in that background, such that when we expose the rendering, when we say, camera, you're set at this, go ahead and do the rendering, it can change the background. It can make it lighter, it can make it darker to make it realistic. So it's something that you most definitely will use in rendering down the road. You'll see, or if you're in 136, you'll hear me talk a lot about HDRI images down the road. So just be aware that it has a technical purpose in the rendering world as well. So we're going to concentrate today on the artistic side. But if you're in a class or you end up doing renderings in V-Ray, the, the rendering side is just as valid. In fact, it's probably more valid for our purposes. Tone mapping is the process by which we convert an image into something that looks like high dynamic range or looks like it does when you're actually in a particular scene. What we're doing is we're reducing the overall contrast of the image and we're trying to keep localized contrast. So we're still trying to see differences in detail. We're not just washing out the image, but we're adjusting the light. Basically, we're adjusting the dark areas to be lighter, the light areas to be darker. So we're trying to do both sides. If we go a little too far, we can get the very exaggerated or painterly effect. I'll show you examples of realistic images, and I'll show you examples of images that have gone a bit far. It, we're reducing the dynamic range or the contrast ratio of the entire image while retaining the localized contrast between pixels. So we can still see details in it, but we're being able to see the whole image. We're seeing the dark areas, and we're seeing the light areas of a particular image. There's a couple software choices out there for doing this tone mapping process, one of which, no surprise, we're in this class, is Photoshop. This is what we'll work with today in Photoshop. We're going to use an automated action. It's called Merge to HDR Pro in Photoshop to do this process. The good news is it does most of the work for you, which is fantastic. The post-processing still needs to be done. You still need to make some corrections. Um, in, in the production of Photoshop, now that we're on the Creative Cloud, we've gotten to a point where it does almost all the tone mapping for you. With a couple sliders, you can get whatever you want. Uh, you used to have to go in and do a lot more um, specific adjustments using curves and, and that sort of thing. Um, so the tone mapping, I, I say here that there's no built-in tone mapping. And that's not really true. Um, there's starting to be a lot of tone mapping in the Creative Cloud. I need to update this, this particular slide. It's available here on the lab, which is great. There's one other piece of software that works as a plugin for Photoshop. It works as a plugin for Lightroom. It also has a standalone application. It's called Photomatics, and it's considered to be the gold standard. When you look at HDR images, if you do a Google search for HDR images, a very large number of them have been processed in Photomatics because it's very, very good at doing what it does. Um, it works kind of similar to Photoshop, where there's a lot of sliders that, that help you get to where you want. There's presets that are built in, uh, but it does a great job on this tone mapping. So let's look at a bunch of realistic examples so you can start to see why this is relevant, or at least I hope you can. So first off, slide here. This is not the most wonderful image in the first place. The top image, this one right there, doesn't have any HDR. <laughs> It's not a high dynamic range image. It's just a standard photograph. The bottom one is a high dynamic range image. 
So let's say, in this example, that we were looking for a place to rent online. Or we were offering a place to rent. You could be the seller or you could be the buyer. Either way, in this scenario. And we were browsing through. If we saw the top image here, this one here, we might say, yeah, it looks like a pretty nice space. I wouldn't mind having my office there. But I wonder what's outside that all white window. Instead, if we browsed and we saw this, and we said, wow, what a spectacular view. But we also could see what's inside the building. We'd say, yeah, that space would work really nice for our, our office or our house or whatever it is. So you see how the high dynamic range image sells this product, or in this case, this house or this building, a whole lot better than the low dynamic range image, than the upper image. So this post-processing te technique can really make a difference when you're trying to show somebody something or trying to get somebody interested in a particular space. Another example here on the next slide, and you'll see this a lot if you, if you browse any kind of real estate sites, you look at any real estate listings, everything, almost every photograph that's done in the real estate world now is high dynamic range. We have our standard photography on the left side. Okay, they look okay. Then we have our high dynamic range photography on the right side. And I would argue that both of those look a lot better for selling a space, right? So there's a distinct purpose for this, even in the artistic realm, through actually trying to represent something, uh, if you're trying to sell something. So I'll just flip through a bunch more examples here. These are all high dynamic range images. They've all been processed after um, fusing three, five, or seven, seven images together. And one of the things that you look for in a high dynamic range image is you're always looking for what's happening. Can I see what's happening down here in the shadows? Can I see the bushes? Can I see the leaves? And that sort of thing. But can I also see any of the lighter areas? Can I see the skylines? Can I see all of this? Is that showing up nicely? That's what a high dynamic range image is doing for us. So even something like this. This is high dynamic range because we can see what's happening underneath the building. It works a lot better if you see this on the computer screen than on the projector because we're losing some of the, the quality of the image on the projector. But you can see what's happening in the shadows of this particular building. So there is, however, a fundamental problem in fusing three images together. And that is when things in an image move. So if I took three images of this scene and I combine those images together, at first we look at it and we say, hey, it looks pretty good. I can see the sunset, I can see the buildings, I can see the lights, all of that's pretty good. But we end up with things like this. Look down here at the car. So the car moved, we see the license plate at least twice, maybe three times, because of those three images. Likewise, we can, we can look through the image, we can see people, like the top part of this person is blurred out, we don't even see that person anymore because he must have moved or ducked. So as people or things move through a scene, as long as you're combining three, five, or seven images together, you're going to capture that movement. And that's definitely a problem. It can be fine. If you do it right and it looks like ghosts moving through a scene, it can be a beautiful effect. But it's something to be aware of. It's something to think a lot about as you take these particular images. So if there's a lot of movement in the scene, you need to be careful. Another example here, a pretty standard photograph. The difference is that you can see the detail in the shadow. If it wasn't high dynamic range, the shadow would be very, very black. So I don't need to spend too long on these images, but I'm just showing you them as examples of high dynamic range. So then we get, those were all the realistic examples. Those are the examples that just look like a traditional photograph, but just have a little bit of extra um, processing applied so that we can see a little bit more in the image. When we get to the creative examples, these tend to have a little bit more mood in them. And so I'll start with the, the easy transition. This is still a very standard image. There's nothing too weird about it. However, there's a certain kind of fog and, and mist about it that is part of this post-processing technique. They've added a little bit of wispiness 
a uh, little bit of an ethereal quality to the image. So it's starting to become a little bit more painterly, a little bit more artistic. As we move forward in these slides, so this is a great example of like the stereotypical haunted house, right? It's like a really cool image, but I doubt that the clouds are really that dark on that day. So it's just, it's a little bit of extra post-processing. It's pushing the boundaries just a little bit, starting to become a little bit surrealistic. And then we can keep taking it a step further. You see how I'm pushing this step by step by step forward. This is becoming very painterly. The sky probably didn't look like this in the actual image. It's starting to, to exaggerate the processing a little bit. Doesn't mean it's by any means a bad image. It's a beautiful image. But it's different than what was actually there or, or a true photograph. And then we can push it a step further. So on something like this, for me, this is pushing it a little bit too far. It's becoming a little bit too painterly, a little, little bit too uh, exotic, but certainly it's something that you can choose to do in this kind of post-processing. Uh, this is a, a high dynamic range panorama. We're going to get to panoramas next, uh, but essentially what this is showing us is a full 360 degree view of a particular scene. So if I were to take the left side and the right side and curl them around behind me, they would touch and become a full 360. Likewise, if I took the bottom and went all the way down to my feet and the top and went all the way up straight overhead, it would make the, the full scene. This is something that you'd use a lot in rendering. But we'll get to panoramas in a little bit. So the colors are a little bit oversaturated in this. Something like this, the wood grain on the deck is, is going a little bit far as we start to get in these artistic exaggerated images. Uh, it usually has to do a lot with textures and sky uh, where the images get exaggerated. And you'll see that it's pretty easy to do this when we do the post-processing. So we'll move from high dynamic range photography into panoramic photography, which is the other side of, of the equation. We'll learn this as well today and how to, how to process these images. So what is a panorama in the first place? So a panorama is essentially any wide representation of a space, any really wide view of a particular space. A 360 panorama is all the way around. So if I were taking just a horizontal 360 degree, it would be all the way around and I'd see everything and I'd come back to where I started. So your iPhone, for example, will take 180 degrees, but it won't take the full 360. So it's a little bit, getting a full 360 does still take some work, even though a lot of our phones can do panoramas rather easily. Essentially, it's going to involve stitching multiple images together. Even if you use your iPhone and you take 180 degrees, if you want a full 360, you have to take another 180 degrees and you have to steam them together. Um, sometimes it takes an awful lot of images. The, the highest quality panoramas have hundreds of images that have been stitched together that make up this panorama. And you can actually get to what's called a gigapixel image, where they have so many images and so much resolution that you can actually zoom in. It's pretty cool. Um, so it involves stitching all of these images together uh, to create that full 360 degree view of a scene. So a couple notes about mechanics. When we get into panoramas, I used to spend a lot of time showing you panorama rigs and gear and, and whatever. The truth is that everybody just uses their phone now anyway. Uh, but if I still explain a few of the, the techniques, you can still work with your phone and get, this, get better results out of it. So. Um, essentially what happens in, in shooting panoramas is if I'm taking a picture and I line up that picture and I have something in the foreground in front of me and I have something way in the back behind me, if I take the picture straight on, I'll get both of the objects in a line. If I move the camera and I swing the camera, not me, I swing the camera this way and I take the same shot looking this way, as I look at those two objects, they're no longer in alignment anymore. One will look to one side of the other. That's called parallax. If, however, instead of moving the camera over, right, I move around the camera like this and I keep the camera in the same place, I'm rotating around something called the nodal point of the lens. When I rotate like that and I take the same image, those two objects will stay in alignment. I'll show you a few more examples here of, of why this matters a little bit. So the nodal point in the camera is the point at which the lens flips the image. So in our phones, they're so tight together, the cameras are so small that it doesn't matter, it's just the phone. 
in a digital SLR camera with a wide angle lens on it, you have to actually compensate for where it is. It's right in the middle of the lens. It's not back in the camera body itself. Anyway, for our purposes and for the camera purposes, no problem. So here's the, the, the view of what I was just talking about. So we take it first. We have the, the blue object and the, um, and the red object. Let me draw on this instead of pointing here. We have our blue object behind and our red object in the front. We take our first image and we get this result. If we move, you know, we're, we're shooting like this and we move the camera like this, so the camera is moving, not rotating, we get this result where the two objects are no longer in alignment. If, however, we move and rotate the camera rather than move the camera, so we move and the camera stays in the same place, that's the easiest way of explaining it, those two objects will stay in alignment and we'll get them in alignment, they'll just be off to the left of the particular image. So you guys are saying, why is he talking about this? Why does it matter? I don't care. Well, the reason is, you've seen this happen before, you get things like this in a panorama, where we have overhead power lines that don't match up. Or we have edges, this is a line on the edge there that doesn't match up. Or we have buildings, and suddenly you've seen this in Street View, right? Where we have part of a building and it gets cut, and then we have another part, it's just kind of nasty. So we can fix this by just controlling how we take the panorama in the first place. So, for example, on your iPhone, you have the, uh, I know some of you have the Android phones, but it's essentially the same thing, okay? So we have the panorama app, and what do we all do, right? We get up and we go like this, right? That's how you take your panorama. That's not the right way to take the panorama. So instead, you take the panorama like this, and you get a far better result in the panorama. So it has to do with where the camera positions. I mean, ideally, this would go on a tripod and it would just rotate like that. That would be the, that would be the ideal world. And that's going to eliminate these kinds of um, parallax errors. So the final results of this, an unro unrolled image. I'll show a lot of these unrolled images. It distorts the image a great deal. We get bending objects. Straight line becomes curves. We can get that unrolled, or we can create an interactive movie, so to speak. Um, it's basically of a static image you can control what to look at. And I'll show you an example of that a little bit later as well. This was a really big deal in about 2002-ish. The idea that you could look around and, and look at a particular object in the scene. Now we've moved on to shooting 3D video, and you can do that in a live video, which is a whole lot better. So let's talk about software. Well, guess what? Photoshop's there. No surprise, this is a class about Photoshop, so we're going to do it. It's available in the lab. It works great for small groups of images. If you, full, if you, if you throw you know, 40, 45 images at it that are a full 360, it can get confused. I'm going to give you a full 360 panorama to work with. If you want to try throwing all the images at it and see what happens, that's OK. We just upgraded to Creative Cloud. Maybe it'll handle it better than CS6 did. So we'll see today. Uh, it is an automated process. It's actually really, really easy, which is great. And it will do the alignment for the most part for you. It is very important if you're going to take lots of pictures th that they overlap. So Photoshop needs overlap in the pictures for them to align up. Um, it's, like I said, it's a little bit difficult to stitch a full panorama. There are two other pieces of software. Uh, one is paid, one is free. Um, PT GUI is the paid version, but they're very, very similar. They're just the PT GUI one is a little bit faster than Huggin, which is the free one. Uh, I used to have Huggin installed on the, on the machines on the, in the lab here so you could play around with it. It's open source. If you really are into panoramas, you can download it yourself and try it out and see how it works. Um, essentially, what these programs allow you to do is when you stitch images together, you can pick like points. So in this example, I could say that green point there in this image is the same as that green point there in that image. And it will warp and bend the pictures to match up uh, together. So it's a very carefully controlled way of stitching panoramas together and gets really accurate, beautiful results. So it's there. It's free if it's, it's, if it's something that you want to do. Uh, you can also use the Google Street Vo View, which is available both on iOS and in your Android phone, that allows you to take pictures. Anybody done this before? OK, a few of you. So I was playing around with it. I don't know, this was like probably five years ago, something like that. And I was messing around with it, prepping for class and, and that sort of thing. And I was on vacation in Hawaii. 
And I said, oh, I'll take one at the beach. Said, Why not? You know, so I got my phone out and I took pictures of it. And I posted it to whatever the Google thing was. I got a notification, I think two or three weeks ago, that it had like 150,000 views. I was like, what? It happens. So because it's the Google thing, it shows up on maps and suddenly people start watching it. So yeah, it's kind of neat in its own way. This kind of an app is fantastic for any outdoor stuff when things are far away from you. If you try to do it inside, it's going to have a lot of parallax errors unless you're really accurate with how you hold the camera. So outside, things are far away from you. It's a good app. Uh, inside, not so much. And then we get into 360 video. Um, this is starting to be very, very common. Um, it was a novelty thing. I'm not sure how much it's really going to catch on. It kind of remains to be seen. Uh, people are shooting this now with little groupings of GoPros <laughs> that all stitch together. The idea is that you're immersed in the action of whatever is happening in the video versus just watching it from one vantage point. So you can choose what to look at. Uh, you can wear your Oculus uh, you know, VR goggles and look around. And you know, maybe if you're in the, like, the Ready Player One movie, you know, if that happens in 40 years or whatever, this will be a big deal. I don't know. But I at least like to introduce it as a concept so that you're aware that this is happening and people are shooting 360 degree video. It takes a lot more processing power to stitch all that stuff together frame by frame. So let's look at some examples. I think the key to all these examples is that things that are straight in real life become curved in unrolled panoramas. Things that are curved in life become straight in panoramas. So they they're take a little bit of getting used to. The walls that I was photographing here are straight walls, even though in the unrolled version they appear um, curving. The other thing to be aware of, uh, and there's a mistake in this, and I could have post-processed this out in Photoshop. You can use a little clone stamp tool, but I wanted you guys to see it, is that if your exposures don't match, you get things like this. We have part, one of the images isn't exposed correctly. You go to stitch it together, it looks off. And there'll be a few other errors as we go forward in some of these images where things don't quite match up. Another example here, this isn't a full 360, so it doesn't go all the way to the top and the bottom, which is why we're seeing the scalloped edges on it. It's just one set of images that go together. Another example here, where we're getting a very, very wide view. This one was a full 360 as I was capturing it. For me, I have a camera rig that does this. I got really into it. This was my thesis in grad school. Um, so I spent a lot of time in, let's say, 2003 to 2007 doing this. So I know it's like dated, and I'm old. But anyway, um, this was one of the things that can happen, though, where you're taking all these images. Um, on mine, it was typically 45 to 47 images to get the full 360, and you can miss them. So there's a point in the sky where I missed. So I'd have to go back and, and clone stamp that in in Photoshop and fix it after the fact. So I said that straight objects become curved. Curved objects become straight. So as we look at this, it looks like a bunch of straight walls for the most part. This is actually taken at the center of the, the terraces in Mirai. So they're perfect circles. So I use this as the example for you to see it. So all the square things have the curving warp. If they're not, then, you, then you're going to see the uh, square straight lines. Uh, this is an example that I think I'm giving you guys to play around with today. Uh, this is another example in Peru in some ruins. You can see the quality of the images when you look at them um, on the computer. And one of the examples uh, uh, here is that when you're stitching lots of images together, you can actually zoom in right in there and see the details across the canyon <laughs> through the doorway because you're taking so many images and stitching them together versus taking one big uh, image from far away. Another example here, sometimes they get a little wonky. Uh, there's some feet that didn't get stitched out. It happens. Uh, this was actually an image that was in uh, the old Amtrak train station in Oakland. I don't even think it's, it's still standing anymore. I think they've torn it down since then. Uh, this was the, the spark of a lot of my uh, thesis in grad school. But you can see all the ghosted people in it. That had a lot to do with how people move through space. Uh, and it became this obsession. So I had to throw that image in there as well. Another example here of Worcester Hall. If you guys move on to Berkeley, you'll spend a lot of time here. Um, it's actually one of those very interesting things. If you go to Berkeley and you, and you walk on campus, this is the building where the lights never go out. All of the lights in the tower, so the tower's the, the, the image on, well, we'll switch to the 
this is how you'll see it. Sorry, you won't see it during the day. You'll see it like this. Uh, so the, the, the piece on the right is the tower that have all the studios in it. The studios have you know, motion sensors. So if people aren't in the room, all the lights go off. So as, as the night goes on, right, you start at you know, 10. And maybe floor two, which has like the library on it, OK, maybe that one will go off. Floor three has like the landscape people on it. That'll go off at you know, 10, 10, 30, 11. And you'll move your way up. You know, floor four is like the city planners. That'll go off. Ah, that was probably off at four, right? And then when you get up to like five, six, those are the undergrads, seven, you're starting to get up there. Those will stay on pretty, pretty much all night. You might have a little spot in four, four in the morning maybe goes off for a little bit. Get up to the ninth floor, that's a grad studio. Those lights never go off. They're always on. So it's just one of those kind of interesting things. When you're there at Berkeley, go, go have a look at the tower. Even though most people think it's an ugly building, it's actually a really cool building. Um, so go have a look at the tower, and you'll see the lights are always on. So this was a fun one that we were messing around with. Uh, you could see the, the Mac computers were those ancient ones, like from 2002 or whatever. They were like the iMacs, whatever. Uh, anyway, it's kind of interesting. So we were, we were messing around with panoramas. We were trying to explain the concept of a panorama. So we decided to take this panorama where we put ourselves in every image as we were taking the image. So when we stitch it together, we have lots of versions of ourselves. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Another example here, uh, small space taking pictures. This was at the Chabot uh, Space and Science Museum. Um, and in this example, I, I chose to put this one in here because of the way the images fuse together, you get a half a person. So you get the lower half of the person, but you don't get the upper half of the person. So like the HDR images where I showed you things that move, that can be problematic. In this case, somebody moved through the scene when I took the image, and then they weren't there when I took the second set of images, and, and you get things like that. So anyway. Uh, this was one that I shot by hand on the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, you can shoot these, you know, we're all using our phones now. This was with a bunch of individual images. As long as you isolate that, that nodal point, you could take a bunch of images and stitch them together just fine. Remember, you have to move around the camera. The camera doesn't move around you. More examples. So I'm going to start flipping through these. Like I said, I got really obsessed with these over time. And I took lots. These were images. My thesis was about SFO. And you'll see a few thesis um, pieces, but these were all the camera or the panoramas. As part of my thesis, I had to learn to draw uh, in, per, in spherical perspective, is the best way of describing it. So all straight lines were curving because I was working in panoramas. So I actually had learned how to construct these by hand. Uh, I couldn't do it by hand because there were too many lines, so I ended up constructing them on the computers. This was before rendering was such that you could actually just render it out. <laughs> so you had to learn how to actually draw. Um, so those were, those were examples. This was one of the drawings that I did uh, as part of the thesis. This one, this was the computer version of it. The, the actual one was a 21-foot drawing that was backlit with all these little cutout people. And it was a really cool drawing. Um, but anyway, it mm, doesn't matter. It was a long time ago. So um, we're going to move right now from the lecture format into actually processing the images. So why don't we take a quick five minute break and then uh, let's me switch over and start the recording and then we'll get going. So it is 837, we'll start back up at uh, 842 and we'll keep going. Okay, so we're gonna start back up with exercise 206 here. And like I said, we're gonna do two things. The first one we're gonna work on is processing the HDR image. And the second one will be stitching the panoramas together. So I'll do it in two parts. Um, and like I said, it's a pretty easy process. So I'll start by opening up uh, Photoshop. And we'll get Photoshop up here. Um, and so the, the first thing that we need are the source images. And so I asked you both uh, in the high dynamic range for the high dynamic range and for the panoramas. When you went out on campus to shoot images, I asked you to attempt to create both, the, the high dynamic range, uh, the bracketed set of images is what I called it, and the other one was the, um, the panoramas, the overlapping images. If 
you don't have them, that's perfectly OK. Uh, I do have sample files available on the course website. So if you go to the website under today's exercise, maybe. There we go. And we scroll down to the bottom. I have sample HDR images, group one, group two, and group three. You can download them all. You can work with any one of them. It's up to you. Um, so if you don't have images, you'll go ahead and download those. I believe that they direct download. If you click on them, there you go. And it'll download as a zip file. Recognize you do have to extract those files before you can work with them in Photoshop. So I would need to go show them. Oops, it's still finishing its download. Well, we'll let it finish. The idea was I'd have to un, uh, extract it from its zip file. There we go. It's picking up speed. There we go. So it's a zip file. Remember, I'll have to right click on it and say Extract All. And I could choose to put this on my flash drive into today's folder, for example. I already have it downloaded, so I'm not going to do that. But you guys can do that. Uh, but remember, it needs to be extracted before you can actually work with them. So we'll switch back over into Photoshop. And like I said, these are automated actions that are available in Photoshop. So it makes, uh, makes our lives a little bit easier. We're going to go to the File menu. Notice I have nothing open right now. I didn't open the files or anything. With nothing open, I'll go to the File menu, and I'll go down to the Automate uh, menu item. And under Automate, I have a couple different options. But the one we're going to work with right now is the Merge to HDR Pro. The other one that we'll work with later on for the panoramas is directly below it called Photo Merge. But we'll start with Merge to HDR Pro. I'll go ahead and click on that. And I get the Merge to HDR Pro dialog box here. It's asking me, what do I want to use? I want to select some files to work with. So first off, I need to browse for those files because I don't have them yet. So if I click on Browse, I need to go to my folder for today. And here's my sample set 1, 2, and 3. I'll do this multiple times so you can see it with, with multiple images. Um, but I'll go ahead and start with this first set, which was the sunset. I showed this example in the lecture. Uh, there's three images. There's 86, 87, and 88. 87 being the middle image, which is what the camera thinks is exposed, one being deliberately darker, one being deliberately lighter. So I'll select all three. And I can, I can click the first, hold down Shift, click the last. I could drag a box through all of them, either way. And I'll go ahead and say OK. And when I do that, it's going to load up the three images, 186, 187, and 188. Below. I'll see a checkbox for attempt to automatically align source images. Generally speaking, you're always going to want to have this checked. Uh, if you shot it by hand and didn't have it in a tripod in the exact same position, you'll definitely want to check this box because it will attempt to align these for us. So I'll leave that checked, and I'll go ahead and say OK. And so Photoshop does some stuff. And this is where the magic of the automated actions. If you watch the layers down here, it's opening up and loading images, and then we get to this dialog box. So it did a bunch of stuff for us, which is great. And then we get the Merge to HDR Pro dialog box. And here is where we can actually control what the final image looks like. So essentially, this is our tone mapping. We used to have to do this manually. The good news is we don't have to do it as much uh, manually. But I'm going to go ahead and walk through some options. So up here, just like a lot of the other uh, Photoshop actions that we've done, there are presets. If you click on. Uh, the presets, you can look through and see there's a bunch of uh, examples that you can click through. So City Twilight, for example, this has nothing to do with City Twilight. So if I picked it, it probably wouldn't look very good. As I come down here, I could go to Flat. Nah, not liking it. They have monochromatic. So if I wanted to convert it into black and white, I could go through and convert it to black and white. They also have a photorealistic, high contrast, low contrast, just plain photorealistic. I'm guessing one of those three is going to be pretty good. So if I did the high contrast, I'd say, eh, it's a little bit dark. 
Low contrast, eh. How about just plain photorealistic? Yeah, that looks pretty good. As I look at this image, you can see a faint bit of ghosting along that uh, peninsula out there. Um, that's because the images don't quite line up correctly uh, when I shot the original images. So something to be aware of. If none of these worked out, here's, oh, by the way, at the bottom there's surrealistic. These are the ones that are the more artistic ones. You could switch into that realm uh, should you want to. You also have the ability to adjust any one of these sliders, which can really help take care of, of the final image. There is also a curves window if you wanted to adjust the curves, but you don't need to. Uh, so let's concentrate here on just the advanced. We've got shadow, highlight, vibrance, and saturation. Remember we talked about the difference last two classes ago about vibrance and saturation. Uh, vibrance is going to be the non-skin tones. Saturation is all the colors. So if I were to bump this, it's at 10% right now. If I bump this up, we'll see a lot more orange coming through. That's probably too much. Likewise, the vibrance is going to be the non-skin um, tone colors. So it's a little bit fine-tuned, a little bit more fine-tuning to bump up the blue, for example. Highlight is going to control the exposures of the light areas on the scene. So right now it's at minus 50, but if I bring this up, you can see that I can brighten up the sky or I can darken the sky. But you see how it's only affecting the lighter areas of the image. It's not doing anything to the darker areas of the image. That was at minus 50. Shadow here is just the darker areas. So if I wanted the shadows darker, I could darken them. If I wanted the shadows lighter, I could lighten them. And you could see that happen in the ground down here in the sand, where I'm seeing more or less of the sand. And maybe you guys can't see it as well as I can on the projector. So once I have it set the way that I want, we'll go back to our photorealistic. I'm also going to try to remove the ghosts and see if it'll get rid of that line for me. There we go. The removing ghosts did a pretty good job. So it looks like, let me go back to my photorealistic. There we go. Ah, so I'm going to have to do it manually. If I click Remove Ghosts, I'm going to have to do it manually because the preset doesn't allow me to do that. So I need to make a few adjustments. Uh, let's lighten up the sky. Let's lighten up. Sorry, let's lighten up the shadows. Up. And drop the exposure down a little bit more. that too much there so once I have this looking the way I want it to look I'll go ahead and say okay and it will build out the final image and so there's my final image so it's a pretty easy process I'm just playing with the sliders to get the result that I want um, we're gonna get into the concept of masking in just a second. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and move on, and then I'll come back and do more masking uh, on this particular image. But before I do that, let me do the merge to HDR on another image, just so that you can see it happen again. Oops. I'll go to File, Automate, Merge to HDR Pro, and I'm going to pick a different set of images. Do that set. Come on. Oh, that's nice. Helps if I select them. There we go. We'll go ahead and say okay. All right, so here I've got another set of images. Um, I can go through and use one of my photorealistics. These ones happen to, to, to line up rather nicely. Uh, let's try a photorealistic low contrast. Yeah, that one's not bad. Uh, I could mess with the other turn curves, etc. cetera, uh, but I'll go ahead and say, okay. Anybody been to the top of Half Dome before? Did you have fun on that one? It's, it's a good hike. Um, so anyway, um, just food for thought, this is from the top of Half Dome. Um, looking down at Yosemite Valley. So this, I like, the, I like this. We'll go ahead and say OK. 
to this image. It will create the HDR. And there it is. So this image doesn't look that different from just the standard image. It's just a little bit of extra, a little bit of extra detail in the shadows. So we'll come back and we'll deal with masking in just a second and I'll introduce that concept. Before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and move on. So I'm going a little bit out of order here because I'm going to do the panorama stitch. So the next thing is to combine images that overlap. And I have a series of overlapping images uh, just like we had sample HDRs. I have three different sets of panoramic images that you can download. They're zip files. They'll take a little bit more time to download. Um, and those, those files can then be stitched together. I have them downloaded already, but I want to show you that I do have samples of the interactive panoramas available for two of these so that you can see them. So this first set here, uh, which is a peak up in Tahoe, if I want to click the see the finished panorama here, I can go ahead and open that up. And really, oh, it's still loading. OK. Like, I checked this earlier. Let me see if I can load this one in the meantime. OK, so this one loaded up. So it looks like a standard image. The difference here is if I click and move, I can drag and look around at what's happening. So in this particular case, I didn't do a full 360. There's a little black spot at the bottom. That's where my camera or my tripod was set. Uh, and if we look up at the top, there's a black dot right at the center. I could fix this after the fact. I could do some post-processing and, and correct that if I wanted to, uh, but it's fine. Uh, and so the point here is that essentially we can look around and we can see what's happening. This is a higher resolution. Uh, the original image is a higher resolution than the web displays here. In the higher resolution version, you could actually zoom in uh, and see details uh, on the shores of Lake Tahoe or, or whatever. But the point is that it's interactive and you can choose what it is that you're looking at. Oops, of course, right? This is another set of the samples. Got to let it load for a second. This was that image that I showed you that was in Peru. Um, and so this is inside uh, a ruin. And it's set up so that you can look through this doorway across the to another set of ruins on the other side of the hill. Um, and again, if it was the higher resolution version, you could actually zoom in and see details over here. Uh, so both of these are available. This, by the way, is a full 360. So I can look down, and I can see the ground as if it were just looking straight down and I was floating there. I can also look all the way up. There's a slight exposure issue there which is causing that little pinch. Well, you can't even see it for you guys. But when you look at it online, you'll be able to see it. Um, so anyway, that is what the interactive version looks like. You guys today won't be making the interactive version. You're just going to stitch a few images together in Photoshop. Hold on, I lost my microphone there. Uh, so if you, hopefully by now, you've had a chance to download the sample image files. Hold on having technical dif difficulties. There we go. OK, so hopefully you've downloaded those sample files. We're going to go ahead and load up those sample files in Photoshop. So once again, it's an automated action. We'll go to the File menu, and then we'll go to the Automate menu. And we're going to go to the last one, which is called Photo Merge. And so this brings up the Photo Merge dialog box here. We're going to leave it as Auto for layout, we'll let it figure out the layout. But we need some files. I'm going to go ahead and go to Browse. And I have, uh, sorry, I have panoramas that have been downloaded. These are the three that you have available to you. Uh, we'll start, I'll start with the, uh, the Peru one. There they are. And it's helpful to kind of see these images uh, in a preview state. And what I'll do is I'll select a grouping of these images. So I'll say, let's, uh, I'm going to hold down Control here. So I'll start at the doorway, and I'll work my way down to one end. Oops. Sorry. Reorganizing here for me. Let's try that again. So I'll select a group down at that end. And then I might come back and take another group starting at the doorway that are a little bit higher. Something like that. I could take another group at the doorway. So I'm kind of selecting a small group. And I'll go ahead and say, OK, 
and it'll load those images in. Now, like I said, you can experiment. I haven't done it with the Creative Cloud version of Photoshop. You could throw all the images at it and see what it does. Uh, and maybe I'll do that as, a, as an example, too. The, the trouble with Photoshop is it doesn't always know where to cut the panorama. It doesn't know where the panorama ends, so it has a hard time aligning images. So I picked a group of them. I've gone ahead and I've loaded them in here. We want to blend the images together. Vignette removal is if when you took the original images, if the edges of the image are a little bit darker than the center, you can choose to eliminate that, and that helps in the stitching process. For these images, there is no vignetting, so I'm not overly worried about it. Um, and we're going to leave the rest unchecked. I'll go ahead and say OK, and we're going to let Photoshop work. Now, this takes a little bit longer for Photoshop to process. It's more images, and we can kind of watch it load. So first thing it's doing is it's loading in all of those images. And then it's going to try to align those images based on what's in the photograph. So trying to find like items and put those like items together. Now it's trying to blend those layers together. And there we go. So like I said, I picked a random assortment of images. So the end result isn't a perfect, uh, isn't a perfect image. But we can see here that there's an image there. This image was kind of warped and distorted. This upper image was really warped because it's, it's looking up at us. Um, and so it did a pretty good job of aligning these images. Before uh, we get too far into this, I want to explore some of what Photoshop actually did. And this introduces the concept of masking quite well for us. So if I look over here at the Layers palette, you'll see that I have a bunch of layers, actually one layer for each photograph that was created. On the left here, I have the photograph itself. Let's go ahead and turn off. I'm down to just this. I'll pick the single image. There we go. And so I have the photograph itself, and then I have what's called a mask. So what a mask does is it controls what we see and what we don't see of a particular layer. And so in this case, this is causing this photograph to be in this particular shape, which is a little bit weird. Now, if I were to disable the mask, we could see that there's the actual full photograph. So Photoshop said, I'm going to create a mask, and I'm going to get rid of some of this photograph to make it look more seamless when the picture that's next to it is turned on. So in this case, I'll re-enable the layer mask. There it is. And when I turn on the layer that's next to it, we can see that that layer has been masked to match up so that these two become seamless. You can't actually tell where the difference is between those two layers. So once again, the mask is controlling on this object as well what is being seen and what is not being seen. If I were to disable it, there's the whole image. And if I were to re-enable it, there's the piece that I'm using. So each of these images is just a little piece. And they're, they're designed in Photoshop to seam together to make the overall image. See how they're working like that? And the advantage of the uh, photo merge is that it will do this for you. You don't actually have to go in and do it. You could do it manually, but it would take a lot of work. So let's go back to one of my high dynamic range images, and I'll explore the idea of masking a little bit more. Now, in this example, I'm going to convert part of this image to black and white, and I'm doing this to illustrate masking for you. It doesn't mean that it's something that you're always going to want to do, but it's a really easy way of seeing masking work. So, Let's go ahead and let's apply a black and white adjustment layer to this particular image. I'll go up to Layer. I'll go to New Adjustment Layer. And I'm going to do a Channel Mixer. We'll call this black and white. And this should look familiar. We did this before, right? I'll go ahead and say OK. And there it is. Notice that when I create this black and white layer, it's creating the adjustment, and it's also creating a mask right next to it. This should look very similar to what we just saw in the panorama, where I have something on the left and a mask on the right. Let's go ahead and convert it to monochrome. And we could pick one of the, the presets, whatever one you want. Yeah, OK, we'll do that one for right now. And so I have the adjustment, and I have the mask. 
because the mask is all white, the adjustment is applied to the whole image. If this mask contains black, the black areas will have the adjustment not apply. So in this example, let me go ahead and click on the mask. So I'm on the mask itself. You can see that these little brackets go around the mask. That means I'm editing the mask itself. I'm going to come over to the paintbrush tool, which is available right there on the left side. And I'm going to paint with black. And so in this case, I'm painting with white because white's on top of black. If I click this little double-sided arrow, I'll flip. And now I'm painting with black instead of white. So at this point, when I paint, the color is going to come back because I'm masking off that area such that this adjustment is no longer applying. Let me make the brush a little bit bigger. There we go. And I will go ahead and paint the sky. And you can see that as I paint the sky, the color comes back. Furthermore, when I let go, we can look over here on the mask and we can see that it's no longer all just uh, white. It has a black area on it. Let me make this brush a little bit sharper. There we go. The hardness is set to 100. And we're going to go ahead and paint in all of the sky. And let me make the brush a little bit bigger. There we go. And we'll paint the rest of this sky in like that. Now, as I get close to the bottom here, I need to spend a little bit more time correctly processing the bottom. So let me zoom or change my brush size there. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time running right along that edge. And so this is the kind of thing where you can spend your time in Photoshop. So let me go ahead and press Control-0 so we can see the whole thing. And so now the adjustment, the part that is controlling the black and white, is only applying to the bottom part of the image, because that's how I've set up my mask. So in this example, I don't really need too much, because I don't know that I would be doing half black and white and half not. But sometimes we have a scene where we need to do some adjustments on a particular image. So in this case, maybe I wanted to adjust the sky a little bit more. So I could go in and I could do go to, let me go to layer, new adjustment layer. I'll do a curves adjustment. And I'll say, OK, there it is. And all I really care about is the sky right now. So let's say I wanted to darken up the sky, something like that. When I darken the sky, the rest of this is becoming too dark. But I can work with my mask again. So there's my mask to mask off the bottom of this particular image. So I'll click on the mask itself. I'll come over to my paintbrush, and I'm going to be painting with black. Make this a little bit bigger. And so I'm not allowing that adjustment to apply on the bottom part of this image. So obviously, you can see that when I did this, I went over the horizon just a little bit. So in that case, I'd have to go back and fix it. And that's the other beautiful thing about a mask, is that it's not permanent. So I'll make my brush size a little bit smaller. There we go. And instead of painting this time in black, I'll flip and paint in white. And I can adjust that mask a little bit more. So I'll come in here and I'll paint that out like that. If I make a mistake again, and I got too much, I can flip my colors. And I can come back, and I can adjust that as well. So you guys don't need to sit here and watch me do this. So I'm going to do it a little bit rough. I'm not going to be perfect um, on it, because I don't want you to have to sit and watch me make my adjustments here.
So remember, I can flip that and make some corrections if I went too far. And maybe I'll. down a little bit more in here. By the way, if, if you want to pan, you're just holding down space bar to pan. Okay, so for argument's sake, let's say that's close enough. Okay, so what I was able to do is I was able to control only part of the image. So I'm controlling in that case just the sky part of the image. So I can carefully control what parts of the image need adjustment. I could do a levels call to bring out more of the texture down here. So for example, I could go to uh, layer, new adjustment layer, levels, and I could work with the levels to bring out more detail in the rocks. So maybe it's more like that. And once again, I could mask off everything that's happening above. So I'll click on the mask itself. I'll paint with the paintbrush in black. We'll make this bigger. And I should clarify that I'm not necessarily saying that this is turning out to be the most beautiful image. I'm trying to illustrate the points of how this is working. Okay, So I now have control over just the rocks. And I've enhanced the contrast in just the rock area. So I'm using the mask to do this. And so in, in this example, I'm having to create the mask myself. In the panorama, Photoshop created the mask for me to blend the images together. So depending on your final image, you may find that some of this masking can be beneficial. So another example of where this might be useful is, let's say in this image, I don't really, I don't like my levels. We'll get rid of that again. Let's say I don't like having the sky be all um, just kind of blue. I'd like there to be some clouds in the sky. So I could bring in some clouds. Let me go into File and then Place. And I'm going to bring in, I'm going to place Embedded. And I'm going to bring in some clouds. I have some clouds that I've already downloaded. They're in my resources folder uh, under collage. There's skies. And let's do cloudy skies. So I've got a bunch of these. I've already downloaded them to use. Uh, if you didn't have a cloudy sky, you could do an image search. So I'll do the Creative Commons search. Search.creativecommons.org. Websites, internet's slow today. Uh, I can do cloudy sky search in, say, Flickr. Maybe. And it would take me to Flickr and show me a bunch of cloudy skies examples. Any one of these would work just fine. I already have some skies downloaded, so I'm going to use that one. And so let me go ahead and place that in. So let's say that I, you know what, I really like. I like this one. And I'll bring it in. There's some nice clouds for me. Let me zoom out a bit. I'm going to make that image a little bit transparent for right now, just so I can see the placement. And I'm going to look at where the horizon is. There's the horizon. And go just below the horizon, you know, about like that, so that my clouds are, are starting at about the same point. If I did it down here, the clouds would look funny. They'd look out of scale. So I'm finding where that horizon would be, and I'm dropping the clouds in right about there. I'll go ahead and commit to it. And we will go ahead and make that opacity go to 100%. So in this instance, we're seeing the bottom of the image. Let me turn off my background. So there it is. So two things. One, I need to, to get rid of the bottom of this image. Or I can control this using a mask. Um, on the top image, so on this background image. 
I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this part of the image so that I don't have to worry about it. So we'll work on the image, but remember I want to work on masking, but there isn't a mask here yet. So in this case, there isn't a mask. I need to create one. I'll go ahead and click on the add a layer mask. It's the rectangle with the circle in the middle. And you see that now I have that little layer mask, that white square. I'll work on the layer mask. I'll use my paintbrush with black. I'll go ahead and make this a little bit smaller here. And I'll paint out this part. OK, so I painted that out. Remember, if I made a mistake, whoops, made a mistake, I can flip my colors, paint in white, and I can get that back. So I'm not actually deleting or erasing anything. I'm just controlling it with a mask. So now I have that part of the mask. If I turn back on my background, OK, so the sky's there, but I'm not seeing through this anymore. So this is a perfect opportunity to use one of our blending modes. So I'll work on the image itself. So I've clicked from the mask onto the image. And now I'll work on my blending modes. And let's try a screen blending mode and see what happens. Now, too light. Let's try a multiply. OK, that one could work, where we're getting some of the clouds showing up in the sky. Uh, maybe a overlay would be better. Yeah, overlay might work. So I have the clouds showing up. That's good on my sky. I've got a little bit of some overlap in here that I don't like. So now it's time to go back to that mask and clean that up just a little bit more. Let me zoom in. I'm on the mask. I'm going to paint in black. I'm going to make my brush a little bit smaller. I'll use the bracket tools. And I'm going to paint out those clouds. Let me flip that color again. Like that. And I'll say it like that. See how that edge ended up with a little bit of scalloping on it as I went across? Sometimes you need to change the hardness. So I've been working at 100% hardness. Sometimes you need a little bit softer brush. And right on the edge, you can kind of make it a little bit blurry as those two transitions happen. And that'll help that go away just a bit, something like that. Sometimes you want it to be nice and sharp. Sometimes a little bit of blur is not a bad thing. Let me press Control-0. And so now, well, I didn't quite finish over here. but. We'll just fake it a little bit there. So now I've added those clouds in the sky where I didn't have them before. So you can see how this masking allows you to selectively control certain parts of the image, controlling what parts are seen, what parts aren't seen. So today, um, the end result of your images I'm not so concerned with. I want you to experiment with the idea of masking. So you're going to work to create the high dynamic range image. You're also going to work to create the panorama image. There's not a whole lot that you have to do to the panorama image. You could do a little post-processing on it if you wanted to. Uh, most of the work is going to be on the HDR image. Uh, I wouldn't mind if you attempted the black and white, because it's a pretty obvious way of learning how the masking works using the black and white channel mixer adjustment. Uh, if you wanted to try to do one of the blending modes and apply it just to part of the image, that's not a bad strategy either. You could do this with grunge texture, where the grunge texture is applying. You could do it with clouds. You could do it with a lot of different things. But it's going to teach you the idea of masking and how masking works. From here, we'll spend a lot of time working in masks in Photoshop. Masks are kind of the key element of Photoshop. I'll do it the rest of the Photoshop lecture, but I'll also do it all the way through the end of the semester. We'll keep coming back to the idea of masks. So uh, it's something to, to get your feet wet with, to get comfortable with it such that you feel like, OK, I understand what's, uh, what a mask is doing. Uh, I should also point out that you can have grays on your mask, which are semi-transparent. So it doesn't just have to be black and white. You could have gray, for example, and it would be somewhat applied. So it's kind of like g looking through tracing paper or something. I don't like to overemphasize that. I like to tell you about it, but not demo it, because I don't want you to get too confused. 
Black and white is easy. It's on, it's off. The mask is applied, it's not applied. Um, so start with that, uh, but do feel comfortable uh, playing around with it. Any questions? No? Okay, I'll turn you guys loose. Let me know if you, if you have questions later.